Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Folks, thanks you, thank you for tuning in. Welcome back today, November the 2nd, 2013. This is The Rock Newman Show. We're broadcasting live from Langston Hughes' room at Bus Boys and Poets. And our guest in this, in this segment is Pamela Pinnock. She is the Vice President of Marketing and Special Events for Bus Boys and Poets. And she has been conducting a monthly uh, series called Actor. We want to talk about that. We also want to, before we get into your specific program that you've been hosting that has become a real favorite around these parts. Before we get into talking about that, talk to us about your position as Vice President of Marketing and Events at Bus Boys and Poets, and talk to us about the mission of Bus Boys and Poets. Okay. Um, well, our mission, we call a tribal statement, and um, it has to do with being a place that welcomes all people. Yeah. Uh, just in regular language, it's a place where we invite all people to come in and be welcomed here, diverse backgrounds and cultures. We say we are a place that honors diversity, that is a place where you can come in and feed your mind, body, and soul, a place where art and politics intentionally collide, and um, we try to honor that in what we do. And folks, as I sit here at this table broadcasting from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Ports, what Pam just talked about is the mission that you'll see on the menu. It's sort of the philosophy of this particular place. I have become a huge fan of this place, not because I broadcast from here, but because the mission statement is lived out in these quarters every single day. Uh, I invite, urge, and encourage you all to come down to be a part of what is this wonderful experience called Bus Boys and Poets. Pam, the actor series, let's talk about that because that's become a popular series. And folks, if you don't know about it, listen up. Tell your friends to listen up also. Okay, the, the acronym ACTOR stands for a continuing talk on race. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit of history about the series. We, we started the series because when Bus Boys and Poets opened in 2005, here in this location, the historic area, <clears throat> the U Street Corridor, we had a lot of folks come in and ask if the, if the place was black owned. Yeah. The, the name Bus Boys and Poets, as you know, sure. were named in honor of Langston Hughes, who was known as the Bus Boy Poet in the early part of his career. Right. So the patrons who would come in couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that a place would be named after a black man if it wasn't owned by anyone other than a black man. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, Andy Shalal, the owner of Bus Boys and Poets, is Iraqi born, yes. but clearly understands the racial dynamic in the U.S. Yeah. and wanted to honor this particular neighborhood and we're in a building called the Langston Lofts and wanted to name his place after busboys and poets. So, the actor series, a continuing talk on race. Just before you go there, I, I have a commentary. Okay. That commentary is, you said Andy Shalal is Iraqi born. Mm -hmm. And you said that well, obviously, correctly, that Bus Boys and Poets is named after a black man. Uh, uh -huh. And people can't, couldn't quite wrap their hands around, wrap their head around the fact that a place would be named after a black man, but wasn't black owned. Right. And here's my commentary. I've gotten to know Andy Shalal, and I have been involved in some very progressive causes. I've known some what would be considered to be strong black men, black men who are militant and beyond. And whether that's Stokely Carmichael or H. Rap Brown or many of those in the black power movement. Okay. I've grown to know those people, admire and respect those people, and to love those people. 
And I'm going to say this. In terms of their ideals and what they represent, in terms of equality for all, Mm-hmm. I don't know a person that's more of a black man than Andy Shalom. <laughs> that, that's that's how that's how I feel about Andy Shalom. Okay, okay. man, All tell right. us about the actor series. <laughs> um, again, people would come in when we opened in 2005, and they want to know who's the owner, who's the owner. So, in just internal conversations, we were talking about. How do, how do we address this with our audience? And so Andy and I were talking one day about maybe we should have it on the frequently asked questions on the website. <laughs> and we, and we'll just put down, well, the owner is Andy Shalal. And as we talked about it more, we thought, this is an opportunity for us. We have a, a business that has drawn all kinds of people, every walk of life, uh, a diverse audience, this is an opportunity for us to have a conversation about race in this space. Yes. Um, we're not the academy. We're, mm-hmm. we're not. We're a community restaurant, and we want to invite people in to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. And so a, commu- uh, a continuing talk on race was born, uh-huh. the actor event. We've been holding this discussion series since February 2006. We have become one of the longest running community discussions on race in the country. Mm -hmm. There are no right or wrong answers. What we say to people is everybody comes in here and gets treated with dignity and respect. You don't get your opinion laughed at. You come in and you get to speak your truth about race. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's an author event. Sometimes it's small group discussion. Sometimes we show a film. Um, it's the first Sunday of every month from 5 to 7 right here in the Langston Room. Which means which tomorrow. Which means it's tomorrow. Yes. And tomorrow we will be talking about uh, black women and identity. And uh, the, the program is called Black Women Guardians of Culture. Mm -hmm. So we will be having that conversation. We have an author joining us, and we have um, uh, another subject matter expert joining us tomorrow. And I hope that folks listening today will come and join us for part of that discussion. Each month when we have this discussion, we invite the audience to be part of the talk. Uh So it's not just a lecture series. It's where people are in community. And, you know, we were set up as a restaurant style here in the Langston Room. So we invite people to have discussions at their tables. Uh, We put a question on the table each month. And so folks talk about that among themselves and are able to share their truth about race, culture, and class. It is my feeling that in order for America to realize what was supposed to be, it's what was written. There's a lot of hypo- a lot of hypocrisy mm-hmm. by hypocrites who wrote a lot about early American history, oh, yeah. and what America was, and, and what it was to be. But that in order for it to be its greatest self, it must deal much more candidly and forthrightly with the issue of race. Yet and still in 2013, by and large, race is an uncomfortable subject for most people to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think a lot of that has to do with um, kind of this whole blame and shame thing. Uh, When you talk to white people, they say, oh, well, black people talk about race too much. Mm -hmm. You talk to black people, black people say, white people don't talk about race enough. They don't Mm -hmm. talk about it at all. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is um, that the conversation, because it's often uncomfortable, because there's often not a shared point of view, Mm -hmm. that people just don't talk about it at all. And what what we believe here at Busboys and Poets is that the only way that we will advance this nation toward one of racial justice Mm -hmm. is to begin having those conversations. People have to talk. You have to talk about it. You have to be able to see someone else's point of view. And more importantly, you have to be able to talk to people in a way that they can hear you. You know, I'll use a boxing analogy. If you Mm -hmm. think about this for a second to try to help, you know, illuminate your point. That if you've got a fighter in one corner and you've got a fighter in another corner, they're brought together by the referee and the guy, one of the famous referees says, let's get it on. <laughs> and they fight. 
you know, mm -hmm. they engage. Mm -hmm. But in this issue of race, you know, you got, let's talk, let's call it white and black. You got mm -hmm. white in one corner and black in another corner, mm -hmm. and they come to the center of the ring, mm -hmm. and it's like, let's get it on, but they end up both going back towards their corners because they never, there is, like you say, there is that varying point of opinion, and like, rarely do they mesh, and there is the candid, honest conversation. You go back to the preconceived notions mm -hmm. that you came in the ring with, and that keeps you in your corner. The most segregated hour in this Sunday. country is on Sunday morning. Right. The worship hour. And we're all supposed to be worshiping one deity. Right. Right. But we're so separated even there. Yeah, I, I think that, that it goes a little bit beyond really kind of the differing opinions. Mm -hmm. I think what it speaks to is the differing experiences. Yeah. You know, when you, when you meet people that their only experience with people of color is what they see on television, they, they don't know anyone. Culture. They, right. They don't understand the culture. They don't um, engage or interact in a real way with people of color, they don't have an experience. They, they, they don't have anything to relate yeah. to people of color, whereas very often people of color in this nation are forced to deal with a majority culture in, in white people. Sure. You know, forced to deal with white people make the rules. White people are, you know, the majority of, of legislators in our government. Um, they hold power and employment. So people of color are forced to deal with and understand that white culture, but white people very often can don't it, have can any... Ignore. Right, can they can ignore. they can sure. ignore other cultures right. and, and get by just fine. And so when you don't have that shared language, when you don't have that shared experience and you're not talking, yeah. you know, there, there's no wonder we continue to have the problems that we have. You know, just kind of off the top, it makes me think about the argument mm -hmm. of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Now, somewhere in the mid to late 60s, mm -hmm. As in 19, I'm talking about 1860, I'm talking about mm -hmm. 1960, 1970, mm -hmm. there's an effort to, through the civil rights movement and some legislation mm -hmm. to start to talk about the redress mm -hmm. of a f nearly 400 year of injustice. Right. So for 400 years, mm -hmm. affirmative action was practiced. Mm -hmm. In reality, right. the affirmative action of those that obtained their status in society, their wealth, their institutions, their powerful place in government mm -hmm. through the legalized subjugation right. of black people. Right. And so you got a 400 year head start. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you have those people who sit on Capitol Hill and in other places here in this country. Mm -hmm. When you talk about just mild forms of redress mm -hmm. and you've got that, and I'm going to say it and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to say it anyhow, sort of that handkerchief head Negro who sits on the Supreme Court mm -hmm. named Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. who agrees with those that try to dismantle what now is 50 years of of affirmative action mm -hmm. trying to make little teeny teeny progress mm -hmm. in what was 400 years of affirmative action mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is an insanity in that there is a there is there is no intellectual substance or integrity in that argument whatsoever what say you <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of hard to follow. Mm. Uh, again, again, um, it's about language because what you describe, affirmative action <laughs> has it has a gets a reaction mm -hmm. kind of from from yeah. white people as something somehow somehow people of color, black people in particular, are getting something, getting something that I can't get. 
And so that's how they hear that. When really what we would be talking about, you called it white affirmative action, really it's white privilege. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And again, until we have kind of a same language and we're, when, when we're talking about the same things, it's really hard for people to understand. It's hard for a lot of white people to understand that they walk this nation, very often this world, in a privileged zone. Mm -hmm. And so what that means, it's not about blame or shame, sure. it's just how it is. Yeah. That means if, if I'm white and I go into a store, well, ain't nobody looking at me thinking I'm gonna steal. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, you know, go for a job and, and I'm white, then, you know, they, I ha I'm more likely to get that job. That's the reality. There have been lots of studies on this. If I go for an apartment or a home loan and I'm white, I'm more likely mm -hmm. than a person of color That's to get the, that loan the, or to get that uh, apartment because I walk with privilege in the society. Mm -hmm. One way that I try to explain it to white people, because the first thing that a lot of white people would say is, well, I don't have privilege. I'm working hard every day. I don't, you know, no, I don't have any privilege. The thing I say to white people to help them understand it, it's the way I walk with privilege in this society as a straight woman. Mm -hmm. I like men. Yeah. So I can be out at the bus stop and I can hug and kiss my man and mm -hmm. I don't feel any threat. Mm -hmm. Nobody is looking at me and wants to beat me up or, or, you know, or call me names because of that. Mm -hmm. I walk with privilege right. as a straight woman. Mm -hmm. If I were a gay woman and I did that same thing, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I had my arm around a, a, a lover, a woman lover, and mm -hmm. we kissed on the street. Mm -hmm. There may be people who would threaten me for that. Yeah. Yeah. They would threaten me for that. I couldn't do some, that. Some, some people thing. would say, "Let me get a better look." <laughs> <laughs> so again, in describing sure. that privilege, yes. so that white people clearly understand, you walk with a privilege in this society that people of color don't have. We run out of time. Okay. It's a privilege to have had you for Thank this you. session. Thank you so much for being a part of the Rock Newman Show. Thank you. Show.